building stateful workloads in Kubernetes. This is going to be so much fun. Here's the part where I tell you I'm definitely going to post the slides on my site tonight. And you're going to hit up chat, and you're going to look at my site, and you're going to refresh tomorrow, and next week, and next month. And in about three months, you're going to get tired of pushing refresh, and you'll email me. And I'll promptly reply in six months and say, no, I'm definitely going to post them on my site tonight. And I'll never post them at all. I've been that guy. I've chased the speaker for six months, and that's no fun, which is why you can go to robrich.org right now, and you can click on presentations. And you'll get to here. Here's building stateful workloads in Kubernetes. You can get to the slides there online right now on robrich.org. Achievement unlocked. Woohoo. While you're here on robrich.org, let's click on About Me and talk about some of the things that I've done recently. I'm a Microsoft MVP. I'm a friend of Redgate. AZ Give Camp is really cool. AZ Give Camp brings volunteer developers together with charities who otherwise couldn't afford software services. We start building software for them Friday after work. Sunday afternoon, we deliver that completed software back to the charities. Sleep is optional, caffeine provided. If you're in Phoenix, come join us for the next AZ Give Camp. Or if you'd like a Give Camp in your area, hit me up by Twitter or email, and let's get philanthropy installed in your neighborhood as well. Some of the other things that I've done, um, uh, SQL Source Control Basics minus Chapter 8. That was really fun to build. I worked on the Gulp team in version 2 and version 3. And one of the things I'm particularly proud of is I replied to a .NET Rocks podcast episode. They read my comment on the air, and they sent me a mug. Woohoo! So there's my claim to fame, my coveted .NET Rocks mug. OK, so we're going to talk about building stateful workloads in Kubernetes. This is cool. We talked about this guy, stateless Kubernetes. So this is the easy part. This is the things that we've already got, stateless Kubernetes. Users come in, they hit our ingress controller, they go from there to a service. A deployment will spin up a bunch of pods, and each pod has a container. We got this. Well, maybe. If we don't, then definitely hit me up by Twitter, and let's dig in some more. Because yeah, this is kind of the stateless workload that gives us really easy mechanisms into containers. But um, our site kind of looks like this. It has more pieces going on. So we, we have the same user to ingress, to service. But now the pods need to reach out to other things. Maybe they need to reach out to file systems to store files. Or maybe they need to reach out to a database cluster. And we need multiple machines in that database cluster to be able to keep high availability in that system. We may have in our ingress HTTPS certificates. We've got more pieces involved in this system than just ingress service pods and containers. So how do we add state? How do we get the rest of our application into Kubernetes? Well, first, let's talk about state. What is state? Well, here's state. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to talk about those states. We're going to talk about this state. State is persisting things beyond the current lifetime. Now, what is the current lifetime? Well, it kind of depends. Is the current lifetime a function call? If we have stateful resources uh, outside of a function call, we'll probably put properties in our classes. Well, how do we do stateful resources across a request and response? We'll probably want to store something on disk. Well, what about across a server restart or across a load balancer if we have many machines? Well, then maybe that machine isn't durable. Maybe we need to store it somewhere off the machine. State, that piece that we want to persist beyond the current lifetime, that's what we need to get into Kubernetes. How do we get that into a largely stateless environment? Let's dig in. So we'll look at various types of state as we get going here. We're going to look at configuration, secrets, data stores, file stores, singleton services. Singleton services. What do we mean by that? Well, a singleton service is, well, that thing that needs to have all of the system to make calculations. Uh, a database is a great example. When we're incrementing an auto incrementing primary key, there needs to be exactly one thing building that auto increment. If there's two or three or five places that are auto incrementing, then we'll get collisions, or we'll get corruption, or we'll get duplicate entries. We could also think of it maybe as like the month-end report. 
the month end report needs to be able to see the entire system to calculate quantities purchased in that month for each customer. Now, maybe we can start to shard that workload up a little bit, but for the most part, it's those pieces where it needs to look holistically at the system to be able to make decisions. These singleton services, we need to place in context with our other stateful resources inside of Kubernetes. Configuration, secrets, data stores, file stores. Let's take a look at each one and understand how we can do this inside Kubernetes. <sighs> First step, kubectl get all. Kubectl get all is supposed to return everything, but it kind of doesn't. It returns all of the stateless things. And this is an intentional design that it only returns stateless resources because they don't want to accidentally expose you to something that you could delete and not be able to recreate easily. So it doesn't show you stateful resources. Now, here's a couple of issues as you grab these slides from robertsch.org, click through to each of these issues, the blue links, and let's take a look at the different ways that they've chosen to do this. And with each mechanism saying kubectl get all doesn't return all, they're like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and they're working towards deprecating kubectl get all for exactly that reason, because it's not all. It's all the stateless things. So how do we work around this? Well, kubectl API resources will return all of the resources. And it also includes custom resource definitions that you may have created inside your cluster. It is indeed truly everything. So we can do this command and again, grab the slides from robertsch.org, click through to this comment where you see this script as it builds it, where it goes and grabs kubectl API resources, uses awk to pull out only the name piece, and then pipes that into a comma separated list and uses that for kubectl get all. And so you may choose to alias this in bash or in your shell of choice so that you can do a kubectl get all for real <laughs> or cube all or whatever you want to call your alias that will go get all the resources and all the things. You can also specify each one. So kubectl get pod comma deployment, and that will definitely return all of the, the uh, things in that category. So as we're looking into them, we can kubectl get secrets. OK, so many of the things we see today aren't in kubectl get all. And unfortunately, that is by design. First step, volumes. Volumes is a great place to store things on disk. So it's great for storing things beyond a pod restart, for sharing files between pods. If they both share the same volume, they can both get at the same resources, which is really helpful. Those two pods now share one drive that does interesting things. Well, the way it's implemented, in spite of the fact that they may appear to be a local folder to each pod, they are a network resource. And so file locks don't work. Well, one pod may consider that file locked, and so it, it marks that locked in all of its places. But the other pod has no idea that that file lock exists. It's across a network share. So it is possible for us accidentally to write to two different, uh, from two different pods to the same file. And so create a naming convention, create a mechanism so that you don't end up clobbering your data across two different pods. OK, so here's a pod definition. And we may choose to put this pod definition inside of a deployment, or we may just create a pod definition straight off. Now, I've snipped out some of the interesting things where we might specify resource limits and health checks. So once I've specified the major details, I can specify volume mounts. Now, similar to the way we mount Docker uh, volumes, we'll specify the name of that volume and the path inside the container to that particular directory. Now, that's the path in the container. And the container then can just read and write files as if it was a regular folder. But here's that name down here in the volume section that specifies where it actually exists on disk. Now, in this case, I've chosen host path, which is a path on the host volume. This isn't a great durable choice for a multi-node cluster because now it's on a particular node. We'll probably want to use a Samba a NFS file share 
or um, blob storage like Amazon S3 or Azure blob storage and get it off of even the node hosting the pod. But for testing, this is great. And so you can copy this, you can set it in place. And now you have a volume for this particular pod. This pod can now save files more durably. That's cool. So file storage. As we look at this definition, we might ask ourselves, well, who owns this folder? This folder is now outside the pod. It's durable. Um, should the developer own it? The developer created all the rest of the details around this uh, pod definition. They specified the image version. They might have specified mechanisms for building it. They're incrementing the uh, version based on build definition. Um, it might have labels like the Git SHA. So if they're specifying everything else, should they specify this? Or should operations specify this? They probably have mechanisms for backing up folders in particular places. They have the specific uh, mounts that they need to be able to ensure that these uh, are used consistently. So maybe we should let operations own this pod definition. Well, <laughs> now things get murky because um, I'm going to update this part, but I just overwrite that part. And, and so Kubernetes has actually thought of this and created a really nice abstraction that separates the concerns of dev and ops which is really, really elegant. So we have storage. Here's our drive, our physical medium. And let's carve it up into little volumes. We'll call these persistent volumes. I'm going to take one of these persistent volumes, and I'm going to claim it. I'm going to claim this persistent volume in a persistent volume claim. And then I will map that as a puzzle piece into the container in the normal way. So the container just believes it has a file system. It knows nothing of this volume. But now I have this clean abstraction. The physical hard drive and the persistent volume can be owned by operations. The persistent volume claim and the pod definition can be owned by the developers. And because we have this separation, now ops can store the files in the ways that they need to and ensure that they're back up, backed up correctly and arranged in the namespace that they've decided. And developers can create the pod definition and map it exactly into the right place in the container. There's no ambiguity about where the, the ownership lies. Operations owns the storage and the persistent volume. Development owns the persistent volume claim and the pod definition. This is perfect. We'll see this type of abstraction in lots of things where we can do the naive approach and include them all in one piece that makes it a lot simpler. Or we can separate them out here into different uh, pieces so that operations can own one side and developers can own another side. Any questions on file storage? Well, let's dig into each one and take a look at how to build them. Here is the YAML for a persistent volume. This is that abstraction over the top of storage. This is that piece of the hard drive. So here we'll specify the type of driver and where it actually lives. Um, host path is great for testing. Access modifiers. This one is read write once. So only one pod can attach to this. We can have read only, we can have read write once, and we can have read write many, where many pods can read and write to the drive. The capacity in this case will give it 10 gigs of storage. And we'll give it a name. In this case, we'll call it PV volume. OK. So we've got this persistent volume. Operations has carved up storage into the piece. And let's create a persistent volume claim to claim that. Here's the persistent volume claim. So we have a name, PV claim, and that just makes it unique. Uh, storage class, access modes, read write once, and the storage, three gigs. Now, the interesting thing is that this says, I want at least three gigs that is read write once of the storage class. Here in the persistent volume, we say, OK, I have this storage class, I have read write once, and I have 10 gigs. OK, that matches my minimum of three gigs. And so that's the persistent volume that I'll grab. Now let's map it into the pod. So we have this persistent volume claim that specifies PV claim is the claim that I will use to create this volume mount. The mount path into the container is identical. The container knows nothing about this volume. It just starts to read and write to path in the container dir, 
And that goes through the persistent volume claim, through the persistent volume, and into the physical storage. That's perfect. So we were able to separate these concerns between developers and operations to ensure that developers can ensure the proper configuration right here into their container. And operations can ensure that the data is backed up and archived properly. Storage carved up into persistent volumes, both owned by operations, persistent volume claims, and containers owned by developers. That's perfect. So we saw how we can do file storage. This is a great way to get that next piece of stateful information into Kubernetes. Next, let's talk about configuration. Now, configuration can be lots of things to lots, and pe lots of people, but we'll look at config map that talks about that configuration. Configuration, the read-only configuration details. Now, we can choose to mount these either as environment variables or as files in a drive, and there are great reasons for each. First up, configuration. So down here, we've specified other details. Now, we cho may choose volumes. We may have resource limits. Again, I've snipped this, but here's that. Um, the environment variables that my application needs. It has one that's called the message, one that's called foo, and I can specify the values for this. Now, these may be environment specific, or again, we may say, well, operations needs to uh, own the actual values of these. The developers should leave those alone. Well, now do developers own the top half of the file and operations owns the bottom half of the file? We have mechanisms where we can separate them out. So developers can own the pieces specific to the container, and operations can own the configuration detail and keep it specific for each environment. Here's a config map. And this config map very specifically says, here's the data associated with this configuration. So I have a name for this entire config map. And then I have keys and values inside that. So in this case, my database is memsql. I've turned on logging. And my API URL is example.com slash API. I now have all of the pieces of configuration specified in a config map. And now I can map that config map into place in my pod. Now, I could choose to enumerate all of the keys and values, but I'm just going to say end from config map rep and name that config map. So now I'm going to get all of the configuration from that config map mapped as specific environment variables in my uh, pod. And this pod definition could indeed be part of a template inside of a deployment, or it can be a standalone pod like this. So now developers can own all of the pieces of mapping that to the correct place inside the container. And operations can own the actual values. We don't need to expose the production configuration values to developers if we don't need to. Config map as files. So if we'd rather, instead of having them as environment variables, make them as files, we can do this as well. The config map, uh, config map YAML doesn't change at all. It's just how we map it inside the pod. So here, we've got volumes, and I'm saying config map. And here's the config map name. That's the name of that config map YAML resource. And now we have volume mounts, the volume. So these two names match. So I know that this is the volume pulling from here. And here's the path in the container to that directory. So inside that directory, I will get a file per configure, config map key. And so my application can choose to open each file, read the contents, and get the value of that configuration. Now, I may choose to do this configuration as files to make it a little less obvious to people who might uh, have malicious intent with my machine. Or maybe I don't need that value very often. Or I may choose to make it as environment variables so it's really convenient for my application. Whichever makes the most sense for your application, uh, there really isn't a difference inside Kubernetes. The config map is mapped into place, and I can read that data and use it in my application in the way that makes sense. So some configuration is secret. And I may choose to not have that exposed. Now, the interesting thing is for secrets before 1.13, config secrets were stored as base64 encoded data. 
Starting with 1.13, you could choose to enable a configuration that stores them encrypted as REST. And I would invite you to do so because uh, yeah, secret stored as base64 means that if you lost any node in your cluster, you lost all the secrets for all the applications in the cluster. Remember that any pod that needs to start up needs to have access to those secrets. So secrets are distributed to every node in the cluster. And that's maybe not great. Turn on secret storage encryption. And at that point, then your secrets are stored safely. Alternatively, you may choose to have an external store and have your application reach out to that store for the secrets. That is interesting, but that adds more complexity. So let's look at secrets stored inside Kubernetes. So I can create a secret here using a YAML file. Now, in this case, I'm saying string data so that I don't need to base64 encode my value first, but I could also choose data and pre-base64 encode my values if I wanted to. Now, this is really interesting. This gets the uh, Kubernetes or gets the secret into Kubernetes really easily. But it's really easy to accidentally commit this secret into source control. And so I would recommend, instead of creating it in YAML, create it on the command line instead. Here's a kubectl create command that will create this secret. Now, similar to config maps, we've named our secret DB connection. And we have two keys and values in this secret. So here's the username and the password to my database. So in my application, I go read this secret. I get at all of the configuration keys, and I can get at those values to use them in my application. So how do I map, map them to my pod? Now, the pod could be part of a deployment template, or it could be just a straightaway pod, as uh, we've done here. I'm specifying now the volumes. And instead of in from or a host path, I'm saying this is coming from a secret. Here's my secret named DB connection. So volume mounts. In this path in container to dir, I will have files for each of the keys in my secret. My application can open up each file and get at the values that it needs to. That's perfect. I can also choose to map these as environment variables. Now, I could just map them all as uh, env from that would grab all of the environment variables, but I can also specify each one. So here, I specified value from secret key ref. Here's the name and the key of that secret. Here's the name and the key of that secret. So now I've got all of the um, secrets that I use enumerated, and my application can just read those environment variables. Now, does it make more sense to store them as files or as environment variables? It definitely depends on the needs of your application. But built into Kubernetes, you have both. That's perfect. So we've got config maps. We've got secrets. Those store configuration details. We've got volumes that can store more durable storage. But how do we have a cluster of machines? Maybe we have an elk stack that needs three or five machines to achieve quorum. Or maybe we have a database server that needs three or five machines to achieve quorum. This stateful set allows us to do exactly that. A stateful set will create a mechanism where the machines, well, in this case, the containers, can start to interact with each other in very predictable ways. Stateful set. It creates pods with predictable names. And we can communicate between those containers and list the uh, and so we don't need to specify a list of machines, like, for example, in our connection string. We can just connect to this uh, cluster, and the cluster can keep track of itself. We can think of this, if we squint real hard, as a deployment. But instead of auto-generated names, we have very predictable names. And we'll see that uh, come through. It really is a deployment with predictable names. So I might use it for a Kafka cluster or an Elk stack, or maybe a database cluster like MemSQL. So here's a stateful set. Each of the pods hosts a container. But instead of the pod being randomly named, this one will be pod 0, pod 1, and pod 2. And now I can reach in through this headless service to communicate with each other. So pod 2 can say, I would like to communicate specifically with pod 0. 
or pod zero can specifically reach out into pod one. Now, because each of the containers can talk to each other, each of the containers can understand the health of the cluster, hold an election if one of the pods becomes unhealthy, and they can keep track of that cluster and ensure that that cluster of containers is healthy. The stateful, the headless service allows that communication. So here's a stateful set, and it pretty much looks like a deployment. We have match labels, we have replicas, we have a template, and here's our template that defines our pod. Um, here, the only thing that is interesting is the headless service. Where is that headless service? There we go, service name is DB service. So this DB service, this headless service, is that mechanism where the stateful set can communicate with each other. It's gonna reach through DB service to get to the other pods in this stateful set. Now, in this case, I have three, so I'm going to get uh, the DB, or in this case, my app underscore zero, my app underscore one, and my app underscore two. Here's that headless service. Now, it's not that different from any other service, except for we're not specifying a cluster IP or a type of node port. In this case, we're saying cluster IP of none. That's what makes it headless. It has no cluster IP. Everything else in this service is pretty standard. And so we can grab a service and a deployment for a stateless resource and turn it into a stateful set just by mingling this part uh, or giving it the service name and setting the kind to stateful set. Now we've got a stateful set. So if I were to curl the DB service, it would act like any other service and it would round robin across all of the uh, pods in that stateful set. But if I wanted to browse between the machines, I can hit uh, DB service, but I will hit the DB1 dot. So if I had named my pods the DB, here's the DB1. And now I'm getting at the first machine inside that stateful set. So in many cases, I would want to create a, a headless service to allow communication between the nodes in my cluster. But I'll probably also want a different service that allows communication from, for, uh, externally from other pods in the cluster or from outside the cluster. The headless service will facilitate communication between containers and the node port or cluster IP service or maybe load balancer service will facilitate communication from other pieces. Now it's possible that I could have others reach out into this headless service, but that's really not good form. This headless service is really about communication between the nodes. And probably I don't want to expose all the nodes I just want to expose the aggregator nodes, the internal nodes that store the data. I'll probably want to not have them as part of that public exposed service, but they will need to be part of the headless service so that we can communicate between the nodes in our cluster. Perfect. So we looked at all of the different pieces. Uh, we looked at ingress and service and containers and pods, and all of those are the stateless resources. But now we added to it all the extra pieces that are the stateful resources in our cluster. We may have file storage. We did that with volumes. We may have a persistent volume and a persistent volume claim to be able to map those into containers. We might have authorization and path details. Those might be config maps or secrets. The URL and the username and password secrets getting into the database cluster. And that database cluster is probably managed by a stateful set and a headless service. The containers and pods, the service, the ingress, those are all what we expect. But the ingress, it might have a certificate. There's another secret inside of our uh, cluster. So we can see that moving all of the rest of the resources here into Kubernetes allows us to build a stateful mechanism and all of this is baked into Kubernetes. We're not inventing any CRDs to make this happen. But if we did want to swap them out, we might choose to swap out our file storage with a different provider. Maybe we're going to store this on uh, Azure S3 or uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon S3 or Azure File Storage to be able to get that uh, system to be more durable. Maybe these configurations might be 
backed by a key vault. And so at that point, then it reaches into the key vault to go grab the secrets that it's baking into the uh, pod. Perhaps our database cluster is not just a stateful set, but a series of stateful sets so that we can have those public exposed machines in one stateful set and the private machines that store the data in another stateful set. Maybe the database cluster also needs some file storage to make this happen. So they may have some persistent volumes and some persistent volume claims along with their stateful sets. All of these pieces allow us to build up a stateful experience inside Kubernetes using just normal Kubernetes resources. We got the rest of our application into Kubernetes. That was really fun. It's really cool to see all of the stateful pieces come into place inside Kubernetes. If you're watching this online, you can reach me at rob underscore rich on Twitter, and you can grab these slides right now at robrich.org. For those here watching live, what are our questions? All right, Rob, that was a great presentation. Thanks for that. Uh, we do have one question so far, and maybe we'll get another couple come in as we discuss. Uh, we do have a few minutes for questions here. So uh, to everybody who's stuck around, uh, we appreciate it. we got a pretty good group here. We do encourage you to post your questions in the chat. Uh, Rob, uh, Justin, in, or I'm sorry, uh, Catherine in the chat uh, says, is round robin the only algorithm for load balancing between the headless service and the pods? Is round robin the only uh, mechanism for the headless service? Good call. For normal services, round robin is the default. And I may choose to take over that with a CRD. But by default, round robin is that mechanism. What's cool about a headless service, though, is I'm probably not going to use it as a round robin load balancer over the top of each of them. The headless service is there to facilitate communication. And so I'm misusing it not as a load balancer, but I'm using it as DNS entries. So I can get DNS entries for all the rest of the pods in my cluster. So is Round robin, the only mechanism? Well, it's the default, but it isn't the only. But I'm probably not using it that way as I'm using it as a headless service. Uh, as we looked in here at uh, this diagram, the headless service will sit in front of the database cluster. This service here is probably that one where we're using ra um, round robin. And so is it the only one? It's not, but it works pretty well. As we get into service meshes, we'll definitely replace that with a service mesh based piece that will round robin much differently. Cool, thanks for that answer, Rob. Uh, and so then our next remark in the chat, uh, not a question, but uh, do think it would be nice to share. Justin in the chat says, uh, really enjoyed Rob's presentation. So kudos, thanks, Rob. Thanks, Justin. <laughs> and then we do have another question from Craig. Uh, Craig in the chat says, uh, how do namespaces fit into all of this? Good call. How do namespaces fit? All of the things that we've looked at today, stateful sets, config maps, secrets, uh, volumes, all of them are namespace specific. And so we can still use namespaces as an organizational boundary. When I talk about service meshes, I love to talk about how namespaces are not a security boundary, only an organizational boundary. And so if you have a namespace, you can definitely separate those pieces. But make sure that it's still OK that they, if they accidentally call each other, that um, bad things won't happen. So I may choose to create all of these resources in one namespace. Maybe that's my um, uh, namespace for this particular team or this particular product. And then I might have a completely different namespace with a completely different application in it. Cool. All right. Appreciate that. Um, we have just a few minutes left uh, before we proceed on to our next uh, part of this session. So if anybody has any final feedback or questions for Rob, we'll leave it open for just a, a few moments before we close. Um, and if we don't see any further Q and A, we'll go ahead and close. Uh, Rob, any parting remarks? This was so much fun getting to share stateful Kubernetes. Um, I love getting applications into containers. And I love the question that actually prompted this talk. How do I get the rest of my app into Kubernetes? And so to the person that asked me that question, here's the answer. It's totally possible. Awesome. Well, uh, that was, again, a, a really great talk, Rob. I enjoyed it uh, myself. 
Um, oh, oh, here we have one more late breaking question. Craig in the chat asks, uh, reasons to have secrets in Cube versus keeping them outside of Cube, like Vault. Any comment there, Rob? Good question. I may choose to put secrets inside of Kubernetes because it's really easy. I map them in the same way that I map a config map. And so the container doesn't need to be any wiser about are they uh, secrets or are they config maps. And so I generally choose um, secrets inside Kubernetes for ease of use. But I also acknowledge that that isn't the safest place to put them. And in particular with secrets, it would be really nice to be able to put them in a secret vault, in a key vault. And so whenever possible, I do like to move my secrets outside of Kubernetes into a config vault. But now I need to teach my application how to do it. And there isn't a real great way. You know, I could hook up a provider that knew how to reach into the vault, but now it's you know spreading my secrets around anyway. <laughs> so at that point, I add a whole bunch of complexity inside each application to be able to get at those configuration details. So at that point, it's this balancing act. Do I want that additional complexity and safety, or do I want the simplicity? If I'm reaching for simplicity, my secrets will stay inside Kubernetes. If I'm reaching for ultimate safety, then those secrets will live in a key vault outside of Kubernetes. And I'll add the piece into my application to go reach out to get them at each uh, moment where they're needed. That was a really thoughtful and insightful question. Thanks, Greg. Excellent. Uh, well, thanks, everybody, for all the questions. Uh, we will go ahead and conclude this session. Um...